Hello, I'm Rick Cartwright, Dean of the School of Creative Arts, and welcome to Broad Strokes. My guest today is Robert Gerhardt. Robert is an established documentary photographer whose work, Life on the Border, The Karen People of Burma, is on display at the Lucky Gallery at the University of St. Francis. Hello, Robert, and welcome to Broad Strokes. Thank you very much for having me. Um, let's begin our discussion this morning uh, by uh, you telling us a little bit about how you decided to become a photographer. The, how I got into photography actually has absolutely nothing to do with my interest in photography. I was, when I was an undergraduate in college, my major was anthropology and art history. And while I was the second semester of my junior year, my anthropology advisor suggested that we all take a photography course so that when we were doing field work, we would know how to document sort of what we were doing in order to write about it later. Um, and I, so I signed up for a photography class, walked in, and the professor at the time was an old New York documentary street photographer, a guy by the name of Harold Feinstein. And within five minutes of him showing us his portfolio, I was hooked, and I've been doing it ever since. It was sort of this back way of just wandering into this f form of art form that I have now have, am completely obsessed with. Okay. Um, <laughs> Tell me, uh, and for our audience's sake, <coughs> what's the difference between a documentary photographer and a fine art photographer? The way, I mean, I honestly am not a big fan of calling myself a documentary photographer. I prefer the term uh, reportage photographer. I tend to do long-term photo essays. The term documentary photographer can be a very sort of loaded uh, term in the, in the field. It sort of implies you just go to these places quickly, shoot something, and then leave. I much prefer the long-term sort of photo essay of it. As for what's the difference between a fine art and a documentary or what I do, mm -hmm. repertoire photographer, I, it's a very fine line because uh, to, to sort of make a difference. It depends on how you look at it. I mean, there are some very, very beautiful photographs that people have made of some horrendous conditions in the world. And yes, it's a document of what happened, but it's also there sort of there's a natural beauty in the way the things all line up and the geometry of it. So it's it's a very hard. It's more about the person how they approach it themselves. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not interested in photographing parts of my life and sort of that kind of thing. I'm more interested in what's going on in the world around me. That's sort of how I differentiate the two. Okay. Um, and what are the important elements uh, that you think a person has to have to become a documentary photographer? You mean like the attributes of their personality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, personality or technique. Or well, the technique, anybody can learn technique with enough practice. There's no, I don't, I don't believe there's any th such thing as a natural born photographer. Everybody sort of has to go through the same steps. As for your personality, it's, in my experience, and this goes for me and everybody, other documentary photographers I know, either you want to do this kind of work or you don't. That's the thing that can't really be taught. Either you have a drive to go to these crazy places in the world and photograph this stuff, or you have no interest in it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's just some inherent thing in you, and it, I, mean, I don't know if it's background or the way you look at the world or exactly what it is, but that's sort of what I, seems in my experience anyway, that differentiates the two types of, the people that are willing to do this kind of work. It seems to me that uh, you would have to have a strong sense or need to record history. Yes, uh, and an interest in history in general. Yes. Um, and why the world is what it is, and why the conditions that you're photographing at this point, how they got to be where they are, and what led up to that, and that kind of, yeah, that's definitely part of it. Okay. Uh, who are other photographers that uh, you uh, admire and you Living have or used? deceased. Either, <laughs> either. Um, the two, my two favorite photographers are Robert Frank, and uh, Eugene Smith, W. Eugene Smith, who is probably one of the greatest photo documentary photographers ever. But he also, again, it was this sort of a cross between documentary and fine art. His photographs, he spent, one of his big projects called Dream Street, he spent a year um, documenting the entire city of Pittsburgh. And some of those photographs are kind of rough, and it's a document of this time period, but they're beautiful photographs, and the way he printed them was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the same with Robert Frank's books, particularly The Americans, when he was traveling around the United States on a Guggenheim grant photographing. Yes, it documents America at that point in time, but they're also they're beautiful photographs. So it's a sort of this crossover in between, and they're they're probably my two biggest influences. The exhibition that is here at the University of St. Francis is all done in black and white. Yes. And uh, I do believe it's traditional darkroom techniques. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about why 
the black and white as opposed to color and why you're not using digital, digital. Technolo technology. Um, the reason that they're all black and white is, for, especially for documentary work, I like the look of sort of that classic black and white documentary process. Mm -hmm. What old Life magazines used to be in the 50s and 60s, like I let, just like that look and how it gets the point across without, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, as for why, I still use the darkroom materials and I still shoot film, I brought some with me. Um, I am very traditional in that I like having my contact sheets and I like having my negatives and I love working in the darkroom and smelling the chemicals and getting my fingers wet and it, I still think it's magic when you expose the paper and you put it in the developer and you start shaking that tray and the picture comes up on it. I still think that is the most magical thing in the world. I would agree. And I just think, in, in I mean, you can make very good digital black and white photographs with a digital camera. And I'm not, I have nothing against people that do. I just, mm -hmm. they just don't look the same as a silver gelatin print. And it's that look that I like, that graininess to it and mm -hmm. that you can't replicate. As film is disappearing off the face of the earth, how's that going to affect your product and how you approach photography. Yeah, I, mean, I will continue to shoot film as long as there's somebody making it. Mm -hmm. um, the question is going to be is how expensive is this going to get in the end. Mm -hmm. um, film prices have gone up a little bit over the years, but not terribly. Paper is what's getting very mm -hmm. expensive. And Ilford, who is the film company that I, the film that I use, um, they basically said they're going to continue making film as long as people are willing to buy their product. Because they realized at this point, pretty much everybody that was going to switch to digital has, and the rest of us are still shooting film. Right. But yeah, there are, there are not many, I mean, the dark room that I, ha that I use in New York City, I share with a few guys, and I'm the youngest by a good 25 or 30 years. There just aren't a lot of people getting into it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're very fortunate here that the university has dark rooms. Some of the schools I've been to, they, they don't even teach dark room photography anymore. Oh, well, we think it's really important. I think it's very important, too. It's like if you want to learn how to use a camera, and the, again, the magic of just seeing how this works with the film, it's, it's an experience you sort of need to have. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you don't have to stick with it, but it's something that I think everybody should know how to do. Uh, how much manipulation do you do in the dark room? I do some do uh, dodging and burning, and that's really about it. I don't mm -hmm. do any manipulation at all. Okay. So, all right. Uh, let's talk about uh, this project that's at the University of St. Francis. Okay. Um, if you could tell me a little bit of, about the history of it and uh, how you uh, found yourself in Burma and uh, that process. Yeah, the way, the whole way that I found out about this project was I, this would have been, I was there in February and March of 2006, so this would have been September or October of 2005. I was at my day job, we were listening to NPR like we usually do, and there was a brief snippet on the BBC News, I believe it was, about the Maytow Clinic, which is a clinic set up by Dr. Cynthia on the Thailand-Burma border that cares for all these refugees that stream across out of Burma into Thailand to try to get away from fighting and stuff. I, at the time, I knew Burma was not the happiest place in the world, but I knew very little about anything of the details mm -hmm. of what was going on. So I, I caught this story, and it, my father is a doctor, my mother's a nurse. I've always had a soft spot for these stories of these doctors that go to these crazy places and set up these clinics for no other reason that somebody's got to do it. They're not in it for the money, they're not in it for anything other than this is what we're there for. So this immediately piqued my interest, so I Googled the clinic and figured out their, I found their website and their email address, and so I started writing back and forth with them for about some information on what was going on, and after about a month, a month and a half, I asked them, I was like, I'm a photographer, would you mind if I came over and made some photographs? And they said, sure, we'd love to have you. So I bought myself an airline ticket and packed my bags and off I went. So that's sort of, that's what brought me to the border. Okay. And uh, once you were there, talk about what you felt and learned in the first few days as opposed to the end of your visit? Of the first few days were probably the most overwhelming experience of my life. I had, when I first got there, I spent a couple days in Bangkok to adjust to the time change. So, it, and it's a 17 and a half hour overnight flight from New York to Bangkok, and then it's eight and a half hours on a bus overnight from Bangkok to Maesat, the town where I was. So I arrived there somewhere around seven o'clock in the morning, went to the place where I was staying and sort of got in my bed and. It was just started chit-chatting with some people around. They were talking about what would have been going on at the clinic, the place I'd stayed, a lot of the doctors that volunteer there stayed at. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, and it was just hearing the stories of what they were seeing. I was like, this can't all be right. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I went to the clinic the next morning and I met my translator and guide and she's taking me around. The first person that he introduced me to was this 24 year old girl who had lost both of her legs below the knee to a landmine when she was about 22. You don't see these things mm -hmm. in the United States. This is something I, I was not expecting this kind of, this kind of people that li actually had to deal with this stuff every day. I mean, mm -hmm. you sort of, you see pictures of things and you hear stories of things, but seeing it firsthand is a lot different than reading about it or seeing photographs or the little thing they might do on the evening news. Right. And it was just getting used to this and hearing the stories of these people. It was the first few days were just, every time you didn't think it could get any worse, it, somebody had a story that was worse. Okay. And um, so, so you're there, <clears throat> you start to uh, begin to understand the surroundings and the people mm -hmm. and the hospital and or the clinic. The clinic, yeah. And uh, how it operates. Uh, as you stayed and, and uh, started your task of taking photographs and whatever, um, did you become friends with these people? Oh, yes. Or? I've stayed in touch with pretty much everybody that I met over there that has some way of either a telephone or email or some way of communicating with, I've stayed in touch with. I send, I talk to the, uh, the people at the clinic once every couple of weeks. My translator, I'm still in touch with him, although he's not real great with email. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of the other people I've met along the border, I've stayed in touch with as many people as I can. They all have gotten actually invitations to the show here. So everybody knows what's going on and where the photographs are ending up. And when I came back, I'd actually sent the clinic all the photographs I had um, a set of CDs that they are allowed to use for whatever purposes they want, and a set of prints that anybody that I photographed that they then saw later, they could give copies of the photographs to. Mm -hmm. um, so I've stayed in touch with many, many people, and I've run into a couple people that I met there in some of the other cities where the work has been shown. Okay, all right. Um, last evening, and during your lecture, uh, you talked about uh, a couple of the photographs. Could you talk about um, the ones that uh, you think are most important in this exhibit, if that's possible. The most, most important in terms of getting the point across or that I think are the... The ones that, are, that affected you, that you're most proud of uh, having, being able to capture that situation. I mean, the picture that I think, see, that's, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to say which individual pictures are the most important ones. I think sort of together, they do a much better job than some of them. I mean, some of them individually can definitely stand on their own, but as a whole, um, it's, but the stories of like the little boy on, under the mosquito get, under the mosquito net mm -hmm. suffering for cerebral palsy. That's a photograph that I am, I love that photograph. That mm -hmm. photograph is actually hanging in my house. I look mm -hmm. at it every morning while I'm getting my morning coffee and whatnot. And it's like the story of that little boy who has since passed away. It's like nobody, if I hadn't taken that picture and been showing this and talking about it, nobody would have known he ever existed. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of, that photograph, the one of the little boy lighting the candle at the, the monastery at the end. Mm -hmm. I always thought, because I, I always end the, the slide presentations with that photograph, because it's the one sort of photograph of hope of what, what could possibly come in the future that will be better than what's there now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a lot of the ones, like the, the people that were living in the trash dump, the, um, the one of the girl there with her family, I like that photograph a lot. There's, I, it's, it's hard to separate them because I have stories behind all of them mm -hmm. and separating sort of my personal attachment to any one of them is a little difficult to do sometimes. Yeah. What, is, what were some of the specific challenges that you faced in Burma? I mean, the, the biggest challenge there was just getting around and being able to talk to people. I don't speak Karen or Burmese, and I know about three words of Thai. Um, but luckily, my translator and guide was very, when he realized that I was wanted to cover more than was just at the clinic, he would take me to these other places and would translate and all for me. Or if he couldn't go somewhere, he would set me up with people that could. That was sort of the biggest challenge was, because I didn't want to be just be this guy walking around taking pictures and not talking to anybody. Right. I want to hear what people have to say and talk to them and spend time with them. And the, the language barrier was sort of a big one. Um, yeah, cause it was more of the communication kind of stuff was the issue. Okay. Um, do you have a most memorable experience from this? The most memorable experience. I mean, if the girl that I said that I met the first day I was there with her legs gone, that was one of those moments I'm never going to forget that. Yeah. 
and just, I mean, just talking to the people, the kids in the orphanage when we showed up with a whole bunch of fruit and they came tearing in just to see who we were and chit-chatting with us. That, I mean, it's those kind of little moments that have nothing to do with the horrendous conditions around. Those are the ones that sort of stick out in my mind. That there are, people do, no matter how bad conditions are, people still live their lives. They get married, they have kids, they do go around their daily, whatever it is that they have to do in their lives mm -hmm. with this sort of stuff going on around them. Mm -hmm. And that resilience is just unbelievable. It's amazing how oppression uh, shapes people and how people learn to deal with it. Yeah, and, it, and what they do to get, I mean, the kids that live in the treasure room, they have all kinds of games they sit there and they play as a way, I mean, they're in the most, one of the most horrendous places in the world and it's just, it's how they cope with it though. And they don't know anything any different than what it is that they're experiencing. Uh, tell our viewers about the trash dumps. <clears throat> I thought that was kind of spectacular. Well, well, spectacular is one word for it. But yeah, the trash dump in Mayside, it's just outside of town. And there are about 200 families of these refugees that live there. And they're basically paid a pittance by the guy that owns this big trash dump to pull out any kind of metal or whatever that he thinks he could reuse or they could resell with scrap and this kind of thing. Um, and that's and the reason that they try to stay there, the, these families, is because the smell of the trash dump is so bad, the Thai police won't come in to get them to deport them. They're relatively safe there. And it's, I mean, this is, and the, the scariest thing you gotta remember about any of these people that live in these kind of conditions in Thailand, it's still better than what they were coming from in Burma, which is mm -hmm. why they fled to begin with. So if you're fleeing and that the trash dump is the greatest place, the, the safest place for you to be, what's at home is, it's unbelievable. I guess I would be uh, real interested in knowing where you will go from here after this experience. I know you're doing other work. Yeah, I've, um, um, yeah. my current project is I've been documenting Muslim American communities in New York. Um, I'm trying to expand that to cover some other cities where I travel. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. I currently live in New York, so I'm gonna, there's a couple in Philadelphia that are interested in my project. Um, there's a couple up in Boston. So it's sort of as I can travel around and get to these other parts of the United States to sort of cover what being a Muslim in America is at the moment. Um, I'm also trying to figure out a plan to go to East Africa in the spring if this, it's one of those, if the stars align and things work out right, to go to uh, northern Uganda and southern Sudan, and then possibly a couple other places um, to document the after effects of the fighting with the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda, which is, again, one of these things that's sort of overlooked mm -hmm. these days. It was, it was all, it was really bad about the time of the Rwanda genocide and Darfur sort of, sort of got overshadowed. Um, so that's another project of mine. There's always something brewing somewhere. Right, so you are a messenger in many respects, a person who uh, brings uh, a understanding of uh, a place and time and people who uh, have not uh, had a wonderful life. Very true. And uh, I think that's very admirable. When you're Thank doing you. the the thing in the United States when you're going from city to city, is there a focus in those photographs or is there a content that you're <coughs> looking for? Or, or Of which, the, the stuff that I sort of document as I go around? Right, yes. um, Not really, it's just sort of, it's whatever catches my eye as I travel. Things, I mean, I live in New York City, things here are much different than there and you'll see some of these different, the boarded up houses, it's sort of what America's like at this point in time from the big cities to the mm -hmm. small towns or the roads in between and that's sort of where this, that series comes from. Okay, I didn't know if like poverty was a theme. No, no, no it's not, at the moment though with the way the economy is, I mean it's kind of hard not to take pictures of America without foreclosed houses and for sale signs and for rent signs, I mean you see this everywhere. It's not that I'm looking for it, you just sort of say it. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't go out and I also don't travel specifically to make the photographs for that. I only make the photographs on the road when I've got a place to go. Okay. Um, so like I was shooting some here in Fort Wayne yesterday, driving around getting, uh, Justin Johnson was giving me a little tour, so I was photographing, traveling around, and it's just sort of that kind of thing. It's whatever I see that sort of, I think sort of shows a little bit about whatever place it is that I am. Mm -hmm. And I assume that you will continue, you know, developing this career and... Um, as uh, long as I'm around to do it, yeah. Okay, super. <laughs> How do you, from a practical point of view, uh, plan your travels? And I, I, I think I understand that you're a father. Yes, uh, and two And have daughters. a family. And mm -hmm. how do you balance that uh, it's career? It's very 
tricky. I mean, I do have a day job in New York City. Um, my, I basically, I photograph artwork for the museums. That's how I, that's how I okay. make my paychecks. Okay. Um, but the jobs, I've been fortunate, allow me, they have a pretty decent amount of vacation time, and it's, I don't have, I don't work late hours, I don't work weekends, so it sort of allows me to be able to do my own work outside of work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, these long-term, going to Thailand for a month and leaving my kids with my, well, now ex-wife, mm -hmm. it was, it's not easy to do that. Like, mm -hmm. you miss them when you're away. That's right. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very delicate balancing act, because I mean, the biggest part is the getting the funding to do these kind of projects. Mm -hmm. It's not something that anymore, it's not like back in the day when Life Magazine, these places would, oh, you want to do this story here, we'll give you your money and you go do it and mm -hmm. come back and we'll run the pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the guys that you even see that are taking photographs in Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, a lot of them have paid their own way to get there. And it's right. like, they can get lucky if they can sell a couple of photographs. There's no guarantees of that. Right. It's not, it's just there's so many photographers around anymore, they don't have to do this kind of thing. Right. Right, so you're, you are your own, um, uh, you uh, bankroll your own uh, uh To a degree, here. yeah. Okay. When, I mean, I have applied for grants and I've gotten a few here and there. There's always a few I'm applying for and waiting to hear from others. And it's that kind of funding. I've had a few people that have given me a little bit of support here and there for a couple little travel projects. But yeah, most of it, it's whatever I can manage to save up and whatever the, like the, amount I'm allowed to put on my credit card is sort of how I fund right. these things. Yeah, I understand. Um, you know, being an educational institution, I'm always uh, interested in uh, talking to artists as uh, and asking them for advice for young people who want to go into the profession. Um, okay. Could you talk just a few minutes about <coughs> uh, the career itself and any advice that you would give to a young photographer who who is thinking about a career in I mean, documentary photography. Yeah, the best advice I can give anybody that's interested in documentary photography, well, there's actually two things. One is get a liberal arts education. Just majoring in photography or anything is not, I mean, it will make you a very good photographer. It's not going to clue you into what else is going on. Right. Um, I'm not saying you have to follow anthropology and art history, but take other classes, read books, Take yeah. political science, know what's going on in the world, and read newspapers, magazines, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the other advice is, besides knowing how to shoot a camera, learn how to write well, and if you and um, like to be able to write articles, it's much easier to do things if you can write an article to go along with the photographs that you've done. Um, right. That's a big one. And, and if you want to learn how to shoot video, that's another thing that is not a bad tool. Mm -hmm. And how do you get your work out? For the public to see it, how 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 would it's, you recommend these well, young people do that? Yeah, I mean the way I do it for the most part is I will. For the okay, actually, a good example is the one here. Um, a friend of mine sent me an article f about a year and a half ago about some problems with the Burmese community in Fort Wayne and that some of the uh, shop owners didn't want to serve them. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine sent me this article. So the first thing I did after reading this, realized I had these pictures, Googled colleges and universities in Fort mm -hmm. Wayne, and this showed up. Mm -hmm. The school showed up first, so I emailed Justin Johnson, found the the website, and that's sort of how this whole thing. It's it's sort of you've got to know, the, especially for documentary stuff. If there's populations of people from wherever you're photographing in the United States, figure out where they are and pitch the projects in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, it's because it, then you get the local community showing up, and then some of who like the Karen came last night, and some the regular people from town and the students. It, it's sort of an interesting way of bringing everybody together. Mm -hmm. But yeah, don't take rejection letters personally. S send out, like cold send out. Just find uh, college and university art galleries around where you live, other parts of the country. Send them a CD with some images and a, mm -hmm. and a statement about the work and s stuff like that. You, they might, you might never hear from them. You might get a rejection letter. They might give you a show. You never know how it's going to go. And don't, don't take it personally and keep people on your mailing list. Yeah. Well, that's, that's all good advice. Um, and uh, students can certainly uh, use that and I think develop it uh, and uh, put it in their pocket for uh, future yeah. reference. Um, I guess that uh, you know documentary photography is uh, I think uh, very important in terms of not only the history of recording of what is happening in the world, but delivering messages with big punches. Mm -hmm. And uh, your 
uh, exhibition here at the University of St. Francis certainly has some wallop to it. And uh, I guess, uh, I, is that something that you aim for? The big? Uh, the big punch? Um, I try to include it when you can. It's, an, it's, if you, I mean, it's hard to describe. I'm trying to think of the best way of putting this. If you want to get people interested and try to help what's going on in the world, sometimes you need to hit them with a sledgehammer to mm -hmm. get them to see. Telling somebody something is one thing, but showing them photographs of something is much, it works a lot better. And sometimes the harder the photograph to look at, the bigger the impact it has. But at the same time, you can't have too many of them because then people just shut off. Right, right. Well, you know, a picture is sometimes better than a thousand yeah. words. So but it, Yeah, but at the same time, you also have to show, I mean, the horrendous stuff, but also the people just going about their daily lives. Because, I mean, it's yeah. one of those 99% of the time, everything's fine with any particular person. It's when it gets bad, it gets real bad. Okay. Thank you, uh, Robert, for being with us today. Thank you and, very much for having me. And having your exhibit here at the University of St. Francis, it's uh, just... Uh, quite a, a wonderful exhibit. Well, it's been and a great experience being out here. I hope that uh, we continue the, this relationship. Me too. So uh, thank you folks and uh, we'll look forward to our next episode of Broad Strokes. <laughs>